So my talk today is called a multi-reference couple cluster method based on the bivariational principle. And this is the work uh, I did together with my postdoc, Tilman Bodenstein. Um, and uh, we're quite proud of this work actually, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy too. So this is a brief outline of the table of contents. I will first talk about the bivariational principle, and then I will talk about our method, the BIVAR MRCC method. So everyone needs a new acronym. So this is our acronym. And then I will show some benchmark calculations. And then I will sum up in the end. So first I will uh, try to provoke uh, the interest of uh, the audience by saying there is no such thing as the copper cluster wave function. What do you mean? No wave function. Well. In single reference copper cluster theory, one computes um, a cat, a wave function, if you like. Now, this is often thought of as the copper cluster state. However, if you want to compute some expectation value or do other physical um, predictions, you need the lambda operator or the Lagrange multipliers or whatever you would like to call them. So then you have this expression for the expectation value. So this means that this exponential acting on the reference is not the wave function of the system in the sense that it represents the state of the system. You need more than that wave function. So if you only have T, you cannot make any pr physical predictions. So instead the state parameters are lambda and T. And we can assemble a density operator like this which we can see is a rank one density operator, the cat here and the bra here. So, and I think that most would agree that state parameters should be treated on equal footing when you want to approximate them. So this is a sort of a, uh, to whet your appetite of, of the bivariational principle. In the bivariational principle, the bra and the cat are truly independent variables. What does this mean? Well, we introduce what is called a bivariate Rayleigh quotient, which is this expression here, and where we have a, we have a bra and a cat. So there's tilde over this psi, which means that it's not the complex conjugate of this psi. Instead, it's a new variable. And this Rayleigh quotient is stationary under all infinitesimal variations of psi tilde and psi, if and only if, the overlap does not vanish, and the Schrodinger equation and its dual are simultaneously satisfied. Okay, so this generalizes the standard Rayleigh Ritz variational principle. Now, the essential ingredients of bivariational formalism is um, first and foremost that it works with pairs of Hilbert spaces. So L2 is the space of cats some Hilbert space, and L2 with the tilde is a space of bras, the complex conjugate space, or if you like, the dual space. And unlike variational theory, the bra and the cat are independent, but they form a unique state. So we have two wave functions, but only one state. For simplicity, we almost always assume here that operators are bounded, so we can think in, infinite dim in finite dimensional terms, basically. Now, question. question, what is a separable he Hilbert space? Ah, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a mathematical criterion which basically says that you have a, uh, uh, if, if it's infinite dimensional, you can uh, count the basis. So it just, what everyone thinks of as a Hilbert space. Yeah, but then this is a definition of a Hilbert space. If you can count the basis, it is a Hilbert space by definition. Uh, Unfortunately, this is not, uh, in, in, in functional analysis, this is not uh, the definition of a Hilbert space. Uh, there are Hilbert spaces that um, uh, does not, uh, that does not have a countable basis. So we can discuss uh, this later on if, if you like. So uh, in bivariational theory, the brown cat is parameterized non-linearly with new brown cats. This double space structure seems essential for mathematical analysis. 
okay, it sounds complicated, but it's it's not really. So it's it's very intuitive when you when you look at what happens, hopefully. So what we do to introduce an approximation to this bivariate Rayleigh quotient is to introduce uh, a parameterization. So we have a new pair of Hilbert bases, and then we have a, a function that maps an element in this pair into a ket and a bra, like this. For example, uh, the lambda amplitudes of standard single reference couple cluster theory lives in this tilde space, and the cluster operator itself lives here. And then we write the energy functional in terms of these uh, new parameters. So E of Z tilde and Z is this Rayleigh quotient evaluated at these wave functions. So we get this expression here. And this would correspond to the couple cluster Lagrangian in this example. So if we assume that the parameterization is exact, which means that, well, that I can differentiate it and that I can describe any uh, bra and cat close to the ground state, then the critical or the stationary condition is equivalent to the Schrodinger equations. So we do a Galerkin discretization by projecting out uh, a subspace of the parameter space, restrict the energy and compute the stationary points. So this would just, this is a fancy word for cluster operator truncation and doing, for example, couple cluster single doubles. So, and then uh, I would like to say a little bit about the history of the bivariational principle because that interests me. Um, so it was the Finnish physicist Joko Arponen who um, introduced uh, from, from my, as I see it, the most general form of the bivariational principle in his seminal treatise of copper cluster theory in 1983. So, he writes, the XS formalism for the ground set of a many body system is derived from a variational principle. And to me, this is truly astounding because copper cluster theory up to then was not variational at all. The copper cluster Lagrangian was not known. At the same time, Per Olaf Levdin wrote an article in Journal of Mathematical Physics in its same year on the stability problem of a pair of adjoint operators. And he writes, the bivariational principle for T and its adjoint operator T dagger is derived and blah, blah, blah. Back to back in the same issue, he publishes together with Piotr Furlich uh, on the Hartree-Fox scheme for a pair of adjoint operators. And he write, they write uh, a generalization of the Hartree-Fox scheme for an arbitrary linear operator and it's a joint, is derived by using the bivariational principle. So this is then Hartree-Fock for a non-Hermitian operator. And they don't cite each other in the sense that, okay, so Levdin and Frölich, they do not cite Harponen, but it published virtually at the same time. So I have from uh, Hans Orgen that Harponen visited Levdin in Uppsala around 1980 which indicates that they had some, well, some common ideas. But I have not been able to, to dig any further into that direction. Now, there is some earlier work that mentions the phrase bivariational, and it's of course the transcorrelated method uh, by Boyce and Handy from 69. Uh, they hint at the bivariational principle, but they don't write it down really in the full general form. And then there's, uh, in the mathematics literature, Michael Fielding Barclay and uh, Robinson in 1974, they talk about bivariational bounds. But by the way, this is the Michael Barclay of uh, fractal fame. He's famous for these fractal ferns and the fractal compression. So they discuss linear equations and not eigenvalue problems, but the, but the equations are rather similar. Um, and I note that Barnsley had a master degree in uh, chemical physics. And then there's uh, Paul Chernoff and General Gerald Marston, also in the mathematics literature, in their um, properties of infinite dimensional Hamiltonian systems, they, they describe what is essentially the time dependent bivariational principle. They formulated it in passing, but they don't mention the word bivariational, but it seems to be known 
already in the 70s and in, in the late 60s. Okay, so let's go on. Um, the huge benefit of the bivariational principle is that it can be approached from a mathematical point of view using concepts from nonlinear functional analysis uh, called local strong monotonicity and Sarantonello's theorem, we can actually prove something about the bivariational approximations. We have general abstract results uh, for a single reference type theory, which uh, are in preparation. And um, for single reference couple cluster theory, theory and our opponent's extended couple cluster theory, we have a complete mathematical analysis. And we also have uh, an analysis of some alternative couple cluster formulations based on extended couple cluster theory, which is now recently uh, published. Um, see also our bivariational multi-reference couple cluster paper, uh, where we discuss the, the general outline of uh, this analysis. However, we have no results for this method that I'm going to present. Also, a huge benefit is that separability, which implies size consistency, is relatively easy to address. Also, if we move to the time-dependent formal formalism, we can generalize this uh, expectation value functional, if you like, to uh, an action functional, which means that we can rather easily derive excited state formalism and response theory for any bivariational method. It's also easy to formulate a theory for explicit time-dependent propagation, which is uh, currently a quite hot topic in, when, um, in the context of attosecond physics. So from my perspective, the bivariational principle is the correct setting for couple cluster type methods. However, so far, no multi-reference couple cluster method has been derived within this framework. So this was the primary motivation for this work. Now, let's turn to the, to the method. A first, uh, the, this is supposed to be a first attempt at the multi-reference couple, uh, couple cluster method using the bivariational formalism. So it might not be the best method, who knows, but uh, at least it's an attempt. So our goal is that the method should be simple and it should also avoid common problems with the so-called genuine multi-reference couple cluster methods. Uh, that's why we settled for a single reference type formalism. And the wish list for the method is that it should be accurate, size consistent, polynomial scaling, and it should also reduce the single reference couple cluster theory when applied to a single reference system. So uh, at, at the bottom here, you can see uh, the bra and the cat parameterizations. I will discuss them on the next slide. So we also uh, feel that properties and excited states should be easy to derive. And as I already mentioned, the bivariational formalism gives us uh, uh, an opening for that. Finally, we would like this to be a tool for quantum chemists and not just you know, uh, something that the developer would use to do a simple calculation on extremely small model systems. So let's talk about the computational Hilbert space. Um, the Hilbert spaces where the cal calculation take place. So as I mentioned, we have uh, two Hilbert spaces, one for the brown, one for the cat. As a standard, uh, we split it into a model space, H0, and an external space. And we do the same for the tilde. So the, the complete uh, Hilbert space, brown cat Hilbert space, is spanned by single particle functions phi tilde x and phi x. And uh, these uh, spin orbitals, they are biorthogonal, which means that we can reuse Wick's theorem and all the nice uh, algebra that we are, are used to from, from many body theory. The model space H0 and H0 tilde is uh, a standard complete active space within an active core, this portion of the picture. So there is one model space for the bra and the cat state, the cat side. This is rather important. Now the external space is uh, defined in terms of excitations from the model space into the, let's say, the inactive spin orbitals. These are the core orbitals, phi i, and these secondary orbitals, phi alpha. 
So we want to mesh with single reference theory. So we define a formal reference and divide the active orbitals into occupied and unoccupied like this. So fortunately, we will not have to dig into all these ugly details, uh, but it's just, this is just for, to give an overview of the structure of the formalism. Now, the model brown cat are simple linear combinations of the, the slate determinants in a constructed due, uh, from the rules of the complete active space. So we gather the amplitude CMU into a cluster operator like this, and we do a similar thing for the bra side. So this C and D are now internal excitation operators and D excitation operators respectively. Since D is exciting in the bra, it's a D excitation operator. The dynamical correlation is then um, obtained by applying uh, external uh, cluster operators like this. I will note that the overlap of the wave functions is given in terms of only the internal amplitudes or model functions. Okay, so how do we arrive at these uh, external uh, uh, cluster operators? This seems rather ad hoc, but it's actually not. So if we consider a, a single reference uh, wave function, which is not orthogonal to the formal reference, we can find a unique single reference cluster operator, such that we reproduce the full wave function. We can split this cluster operator uniquely into an internal part and an external part. The internal part we convert into a, uh, like a CASI expansion like this, and we keep the external part like this. For a general bra, we call it omega here, we do the same. But now S is a complete single reference a couple cluster D excitation operator. The internal part is converted to a linear expansion like this, and we keep the external part. It's completely symmetrical to this. Our opponent did the trick. He post multiplied this bra with an invert with e to the minus t, which is an invertible operator. So we're not introducing any new assumptions or removing any, any assumptions. So this is now the general bra wave function. And this is now, the, this is the extended Kappa cluster parametrization. And to get to the normal Kappa cluster parametrization, we simply convert the exponential to a linear form. So we plug all these various parameters into the bivariate um, Rayleigh quotient to obtain the bivariate energy functional depending on all these variables. Now, I want to stress that this if the cluster operators are not truncated, is exact, just like single reference copper cluster theory in an untruncated formulation is exact. If we look at the stationary conditions by differentiating the energy functional, we obtain an, a left and a right eigenvalue problem for an effective CASI Hamiltonian. This K matrix is, is the matrix of this inner part of this energy functional. So there's a symmetry between the bra and the cat uh, C and D operators. So that the CASI amplitudes are always uh, eigenvectors of an effective Hamiltonian. If we turn to the stationary conditions on the external space, we obtain uh, what we would call T equations, and they are different from single reference couple cluster equations. And we obtain some lambda, lambda equations for when differentiating with respect to t. This is rather analogous to uh, standard single reference copper cluster theory. Okay, so truncation scheme for this method is that we take a complete active space of n electrons in m orbitals. The internal cluster operators are never truncated. We always keep the full uh, operator. The external uh, operators are truncated in a standard single, double, triples, etc. fashion. And we usually include what is called the first order interaction space, which are single and double excitations from the model space. This implies that the um, uh, energy will be correct to second order in perturbation theory. This is very important. The formal scaling of this method is 
linear with respect to the number of determinants in the, in the model space, and also linear in the scaling of standard single reference couple cluster theory, which is not too bad. Now, uh, the formal reference is a potential problem. This is a uh, single reference based multi reference couple cluster theory is often criticized for, uh, for having a bias towards the formal reference. So the idea is to use a bivariational optimization of the formal reference to get rid of that, which means that we introduce a CAS orbital rotation operator, which has like two independent parts. Uh, this is a single excitation, and this is a single de excitation in the CAS only. And this leads to what we would call the orbital adaptive uh, energy functional. So this optimization of the formal reference is an optional step in our method. So uh, some listeners might wonder, isn't this very similar to CAS-CC of the peak of Olifant and Adamovich? Well, after all the, well, it's very similar because the ket ansatz is actually identical. If you look at CAS-CC, it's defined by projections of a partially similarity transformed Schrodinger equation like this. We project it to obtain an eigenvalue problem for C, which is same as we have. And the external projection gives single reference couple cluster equations. This is not the same as we have. Moreover, the, uh, even if the cat ansatz is identical uh, uh, to our, the present method, the bra is very different. In particular, in our method, the bra is sort of derived from uh, in the same way as the cat is, the, is motivated. Whereas in CAS-CC, it is sort of, uh, it, it, it is defined by the way you decide to project this equation. So as a consequence, unfortunately, in CAS-CC, the multiplicatively separable structure in both the bra and the cat is lost. So this is a subtle difference between the two formulations. To sum up, the two methods have different equations and therefore different solutions, even if the cat is the same. On the other hand, uh, we will see that the absolute energies uh, are rather similar, which we'll see later in the presentation. Okay, now for the benchmark calculations. This is done uh, by my postdoc, Tilman Bodenstein. Um, he wrote a full CI-based implementation of this to have it uh, to quickly get something that we could do tests on. So this means that it's limited to small systems only. We have done benchmark calculations presented in our in our paper on uh, hydrogen fluoride and the N2 and H8 H8 systems, and also the classic system of insertion of beryllium into, into the hydrogen molecule. So this is an overview of uh, of the algorithm, and I think uh, instead of going to this in detail, I will I will go further. And if the people are interested, they can have a look at the paper, or we can discuss this uh, the algorithm to solve the equations iteratively. So we need a thorough test of this unconventional formalism. So therefore, we would like to emphasize the density operator because it contains all the physics. So this would be so delta rho f. FCI would be the difference uh, from uh, the computed density operator from our method with the full CI density operator. And if we compute the, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of this density operator, we would have an, a measure of the error in the calculation, which is more detailed uh, in, a, in a way than just computing energies. However, we also compute uh, energy errors spin contamination and dipole moments and various statistical errors along the reaction paths. Um, so first, we, have, we will have a look at the single bond breaking of hydrogen fluoride with double set of valence bases, pretty standard uh, calculation. Uh, and this is, no, this is no match for, um, for our method. Uh, we notice here that um, what you have done in, in this plot, there are two calculations. Is M R C C S D. You have five more minutes now. Yeah, I know. Thank you. And so this is the 2 2 CAS uh, space. And then another calculation where we also include the first order interaction phase. 
And we see here that uh, in, the, in the energy differences with respect to, to full CI, that the first order interaction phase is a huge improvement. So it's really important. Moreover, if you look at the, the, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm or Frobenius norm of the difference of the density operators, it's fairly small along the whole path. And in this plot, we have not shown the, the black curve, unfortunately, but we see that the error here is uniformly rather small, which indicates a high quality calculation for the system. Now, the second application I will show is the um, complicated potential curve of the beryllium dehydride. This is the full CI results computed in with no symmetry whatsoever. And uh, so this system uh, introduced by Purvis and uh, co-workers in 83, which is now a standard system for testing complicated uh, or testing novel multi-reference methods. Um, is parameterized such that the, um, for x equals zero, we have molecular uh, beryllium dehydride, where the beryllium atom is in the middle of the two uh, hydrogen atoms. And as x increases, the beryllium uh, atom moves away. So uh, apparently, uh, the ground state changes nature along this path. So in this region, it's actually an excited state. Moreover, uh, the dominant determinant changes around here, which means that it's a very challenging system for multi-reference methods. Um, however, uh, it is common to claim that this is a 50-50 mixture around here. But on this basis, this double zeta type basis from Purvis and co-workers paper, it's not a 50-50 mixture. It's more like 52-39, which means that it's, it should be suitable for uh, single reference based methods. So, if you now look at the Bivar MRCCSD22 calculation, uh, it has a fairly large error in this, in this uh, multi-reference region. And here we also show the, uh, the uh, density matrix error along the reaction uh, coordinate. Now we increase the model space to four and six, which uh, improves the error quite a lot. And also the density matrix improves. Now, the MRCCSD two in two with the first order interactive interaction space further reduces the error. So now it's just within uh, chemical accuracy. And we see here that the density matrix on average improves. And then finally, we have the extended copper cluster single double two to four order interaction space, which means that we don't do this uh, e to the s to one plus lambda. So it's also quite good. Um, we see that our method has reasonable accuracy uh, and it seems to have a rather smooth convergence with respect to increasing, uh, increasing the, um, the number of degrees of freedom in the, in the parameterization. But this, there is a discontinuity at the multi-reference point, a pronounced discontinuity, which is not so strange. These calculations are not done with optimizing the, the reference. Stephen, I oh. urge you to think about the time so that we will time for any questions. Uh, pardon? Think about the time. Yeah, yeah I, I noticed it. Uh, it says three I minutes here. So I will, I will first finish up now. I will finish up now um, by saying that we did a comparison with other multi reference type methods. Uh, and the accuracy is. Uh, uh, they are similar in the different methods. And we note also that the more sophisticated genuine methods, they also have trouble around the multi-reference, in the multi-reference region. So, um, yeah. And here, finally, uh, we have computed dipole, uh, dipole moment errors. And we see that as we do a more and more a higher level of multi-reference theory, uh, we get better and better results. So it seems that our method is highly accurate with respect to properties as well. So to sum up, um, I would just like to say that this may have the potential to become a tool for quantum chemists because it's fairly robust and uh, it's not too expensive. The next step is to, uh, to do different stuff. The most important may be to do uh, the mathematical analysis of the method and excited state theory and also this efficient tensor-based uh, implementation. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention.
And these are my acknowledgments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Seaman. Um, this presentation is now open for questions. I don't see anything in the chat or anyone raising a hand. So I have my question myself. Uh, so I, f I found it a bit disturbing that the equation you end up with is asymmetric, and the, that the bra and the ket side look different. And the bra side is, is, is what's usually referred to as the lambda side. And I'm mm -hmm. sometimes asking me, in an alternative universe, would somebody derive the lambda side first and then maybe a few years later come up with the, the cat side as the bra in this alternative? So I don't, <laughs> feel, I don't feel like the cat is as natural as the bra. Is there a way you can make this symmetric or is it just that I'm looking for a symmetry that can't be there? Yeah, it's a good question. So the, 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 let me just uh, stress that for just standard single reference couple cross the theory, the same phenomenon happens. The bra and the cat, they suddenly, you, you break the symmetry between the way you parameterize the bra and the cat. This, uh, this is not particular to this special method, but I agree that it, it seems a little bit, well, you use the word disturbing, but I would say, it would be better if it was more symmetric. However, the whole idea of this bivariational formalism into, is to introduce flexibility that you lack in a true variational theory by allowing the cat and the bra to have different approximations. This flexibility is precisely what allows you to have a size consistent scheme because you can have this multiplicative separa separability in both the bra and the cat at the same time as having a polynomial scaling method. All so right. I, this is my viewpoint of this. Okay. Thank you very much. 